Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Just a reminder to you that uh, we do, I try to record all the messages and they are put on the website lakeshorefellowshipchurch.org as well as if you would like a DVD copy, if you are gone one week and want to copy and catch up and don't have internet access or would rather have a DVD copy, let me know and I can make you one. I'd be glad to make you a copy. Even if you miss on that Sunday, you call me up Sunday and say, can you make a copy? I'll do my best even to run it out to you uh, if possible that week because I want you to be able to stay uh, with us and learning and growing. Uh, There are devotional books on the back counter there. I do encourage you to follow along. A lot of stuff that we read through throughout the week. And uh, again, as we meet together on Sundays, uh, it always helps. They're also on uh, the website at lakeshorefellowshipchurch.org. You can download a digital copy for anybody who knows what I'm talking about. Uh, Some of you probably have no clue what I mean by that. Uh, but there's a digital copy as well in a PDF uh, format. And I know I'm speaking a foreign language to some of you, uh, but some of you do understand uh, what that is. I want to kind of historically help understand where we are at in our study uh, because it makes much more sense as we go through prophetic books. And we've been following along and kind of understanding our history of where we're at in the nation of Israel. What I do want you to do, actually, uh, if you want to, I already had you turn to Isaiah 7. If you want to keep a bookmark there and turn over to 2 Kings 16, you can do that. If not, you can just listen. There's four verses we're going to read there first. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Ramallah, this is 2 Kings 16.1, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Now, I do have copies of these on the back table as well, but we're going to go to our timeline here to help us kind of get a visual of what's going on. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on on this timeline, but just to get you an idea that these are the dates going on here, B.C. dates. These are the kingdoms. So we have the northern kingdom, we have the southern kingdom of Judah. And so this is the area we're focusing on now. And right now we're in a period uh, where you see Isaiah prophesies. We're going to talk about him. He prophesied for many years. And we see that the king of the north at the time is Pekah. We also see that the king of south was Jotham, but now it's Ahaz. If you're wondering why these little, little uh, things that are, you know, geographical shapes here, basically it's probably assuming that these sons co-reigned with their dads. So when it says that the reign began at a certain time or a certain age, they were probably still reigning together with their dads, but officially called kings or co-regents at the time. Jotham was a, a fairly godly king, uh, okay in following God, but his son Ahaz was opposite. Now we're going to see a little bit later on that Hezekiah was a good king, a very godly king, but something happened to this man right here, Ahaz, that was not good, and he led the nation in a way that was not good. Verse 2 here in 2 Kings 16. When he was 20 years old, he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, his father, as David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his sons as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on high places on the hills and under every green tree. So we see here that he was so wicked that he even offered his son as a sacrifice. Now when you first hear that, you can be appalled, like how in the world could a nation, an individual, offer a child as a sacrifice? 
Before we try to condemn a nation, let's think about the abortion practice in the United States. What that is, is is sacrificing children. Why? For the God of basically pleasure, the God of convenience, the God of our own selfish desires. We do the same. Here, that is what Ahaz is doing. He's offering a sacrifice, offering his child on the altar, the wicked practices of the pagan nations around them. This is the situation in which this passage in Isaiah chapter 7 takes place. I want to kind of get a map of understanding here as we go into the passage to help us understand that we're going to be talking about basically three kings. There's a fourth we're going to mention, but more of a nation. We have the nation of Assyria, which was a nation growing mighty in power in this region up here. Then we have Damascus, which is the capital city of Syria. By the way, Syria and Assyria are completely different. It's easy to get those confused in the Bible, because, but they're completely different nations. Um, and then we see here Samaria, which is the capital of Israel, the northern tribes. Jerusalem, the capital of the southern tribes. We're going to be talking about Rezin, who is the ca- uh, king of Damascus, capital of Syria. And then Pekah, who was king of the Israelites, and his capital was in Samaria. So hopefully you can kind of a little bit understand that because we're going to be going through these names to help us understand what this passage is talking about. The first lesson that I want to see this morning is that God wants us to live in trust and not fear. Philippians chapter 4 says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Very simple verse, very popular verse. Probably all of you have heard it several occasions. You've probably quoted it on several occasions. But it's one of these verses that is often so hard to put into practice in our daily lives. And we see an example of what took place here in Israel as Israel had become fearful of impending war. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. And in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramallah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So to get an understanding of what's going on, we'll go back to a map, a little bit different map to help us understand. This area here called Aram is also another name for Syria. There's the capital, Damascus. These are the northern tribes, and at this time, Samaria was the capital of the northern tribes of Israel. This kingdom unites together with this kingdom to attack this kingdom, specifically here, Jerusalem. And when Ahaz found out that Damascus had joined together with Samaria and were preparing to do battle against Jerusalem, they were scared. And it says they shook as trees shake in the wind. Now, I visited most of your houses, and a few of you live in some wooded areas. If you've ever been to my house, you know that I kind of live in the middle of the woods. And I love living in the middle of the woods, except when the wind is really strong. Because as I'm laying there at night and I hear the wind whip through the trees, I offer a little prayer. God, please don't let a tree fall on our house. Because sometimes that wind really, really starts to whip. And occasionally we'll hear this loud crack. And you're like, I hope that's not by the house. 
And, you know, we like living in the woods. Some people don't like it for that reason. In general, we absolutely, I absolutely love living in the woods. But I understand what it means for trees to shake in the wind. Even this morning, it wasn't that strong of a wind, but it was fairly windy when I walked outside, and you could see it, and you could hear it as it shakes. That describes the fear that the people were going through. Why? Because they were under attack of a foreign enemy. Now, I want you to understand this. That fear in and of itself is an emotion to begin with. Just like the idea often of the idea of uh, um, anger. It's an emotion. The question is, what do you do when that emotion comes? So it is not sin to have fear. We all have fear. God has given us fear for a healthy reason. To help be afraid of certain things that aren't really good for us. So fear can be a positive thing or a negative thing. So it's not wrong to have fear, but what do we do when fear comes our way? What do we do? Do we dwell on that where it turns into worry? It turns into being anxious. Or do we take that fear and turn it over to God? The Israelites had a choice. They could turn it over to God and trust him or the people of Judah, actually, because people of Israel were coming after them. Or they could simply just choose to live in fear, be afraid. And God came along to help them by sending Isaiah to encourage them not to be fearful of the coming attack. Look at verse 3. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet with Ahaz, you, and Shir Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the washer's field, and say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. At the fierce anger of Rezin and Siri and the son of Ramalia, because Syria with Ephraim, the son of Ramalia, has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it. Let's conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabiel as king in the midst of it. A lot of words there, a lot of thoughts, but here's simply what it is. God says to Isaiah, I know exactly the plan of the northern tribes. I know exactly what they're doing. I know how they want to conquer Judah. But Isaiah, go send a message to Ahaz and tell him, don't be afraid, I am in control, God is saying. I know the plans that they plan, and I know every single one of them, and I can ruin their plans. You don't have to be afraid. Now, it's one thing to say and another thing to really believe. All right? Okay, God, you tell me to trust, but it doesn't look like things are going well for us. And we're faced with a choice, what we see physically going on and what we can believe in our hearts and trust that God is going to take care of things. And they're faced with this choice just as we're often faced with those choices. But God describes them as stumps of firebrands. Now, many of you have probably never used that term before. In fact, I had to try to figure out what in the world does it mean that they're stumps of firebrands. Basically, it's kind of this. The illustration is that they're just smoldering ashes. Basically, they're not strong enough. They're not hot enough to cause a fire or to cause any damage. They're just smoldering. You don't have to worry about them. Basically, it's an illustration of kind of weakness. In those days, the idea of is you need to stoke the fire up and get it real hot to smelt things or to burn things or to really be useful. And here it's like, look, they're just kind of like, they're kind of like that stump that just is kind of like smoldering, but yet it's just not able to get hot enough to be any good. That's what he describes them as. Saying their power compared to God's power is nothing. 
And he reminded him that God was the one with ultimate power, that God had the power to stop Judah's enemies. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. And within 65 years, Ephraim shall be shattered for being a people, and the head of Ephraim and Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. And then he says this, If you are not firm in the faith, will you will not be firm at all. He says, look, the choice is up to you. They are going to be destroyed. They are not going to exist. In fact, in 65 years, he says, they will no longer exist even as a nation. You're faced with this choice. Are you going to live in fear or are you going to live in trust? You know, we're given that choice today, aren't we? Are we going to live in fear? Flip your TV on, watch news for an hour. What does it say? Is it promoting peace and love? No, it's fear. And in fact, the more the news media outlets talk, the more they draw people in in fear. They promote that. It's exalted. And you have a choice. Am I going to worry? Yes, is the world falling apart? Yeah. Do I have to live in fear? No. Why? Because we have a God who is in control. We have a God who is on our side. We have a God who is more powerful than that. Does it mean that we might have to face suffering? Yes. Does it mean that life may get difficult at times? Yes. Does it mean we have to live in worry? No. Why? That's what everybody else does around us. That's what the world lives in, is worry and fear and frustration. And people act and respond out of fear. But we don't have to live like that. And what God wanted to do is he wanted Ahaz to see his power. What does he say here in verse 10? And again, God spoke to Ahaz and said, ask a sign of the Lord. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as the heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. God says, look, Ahaz, I will even show you my greatness right now. Ask me a sign. Basically, ask me to do some miraculous thing, and I will do it. And he says this. He says, you can ask as high as the heaven or as deep as Sheol, basically the deepest part of the earth. He says, you can ask whatever you want, and I will give it to her. I will show you this sign that I'm in control. But Ahaz, he sounds super spiritual, says, no, 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 I don't want to test the Lord God. What it was is he didn't want to trust God. Ahaz was living in for himself. He was living in wickedness. He did not want to trust God. And sadly, he wasn't able to see God work. And we're reminded here, we have been given a sign. What is the sign? We've been given the word of God. The Word of God over and over and over and over in so many ways shows us God's power, shows us that we don't need to live in fear, shows us that He's in control. That is the sign that we have been given that we can trust in Him. What God does want us to do is to fear Him and to wait for Him to act. The end of Isaiah chapter 7 is about the prophecy of what's going to happen to Syria, Israel, and Judah. Then he starts and continues on here in chapter 8, verse 3. And I went to the prophetess, basically he went to his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Mahershalel Hashbaz. Now what a name, huh? Would you like that name? I have to write that over and over? Uh, I wouldn't want that. I'd, I'd copy and paste it if it was in the computer because that's a long name. You know, call me Ma for short or whatever. But why does God give him the name? Because it means something. 
It means basically this, verse 4, for before the boy know, knows how to cry, my father, my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Basically, he was instructed by God to call your children, and we see this in the prophets at times, they had to name their children certain things as an illustration to the nations around them. And basically saying this is it's not going to be long in this short time that these nations will be defeated. In fact, he says, he says here, before the son knows how to cry, my father or mother. Basically, in the next two to three years, these nations, Israel and Damascus, who thought they were so strong to fight against Judah, will be destroyed. And we see here in Isaiah 8 that he was instructed to think differently than the world around him. Look at verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of the people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that people call conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. He tells Isaiah, think differently than the world. Don't fear what the world fears. Don't panic as the world panics. How do we do that then? This is something that most people struggle with, the idea of fear and panic and worry. How do we not do that? Now again, as I mentioned, the original fear is an emotion, but what do we do with that emotion? Well, we're told in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, think, thinking the way the world thinks, but be transformed by the what? The renewal of your mind. By the test, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. How do you overcome fear? Is you go overcome fear by having your mind renewed by God's word. So you can think as God thinks. How does God think about this situation? You see, the world thinks about it completely different than God thinks about it. And Isaiah here has said, don't think like the world thinks. But think differently. And you do that by listening to what God says. Look at verse 13. The Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He says, don't be afraid of what the world has. Instead, live with a healthy fear of God. If you're going to be consumed by something, don't let it be the negative things of the world. Let it be the positive truth of God's Word that consumes your mind, that renews your mind, that strengthens you, that helps you, that encourages you. And ultimately, we need to realize that God's Word often produces different results than the words of the world does. Have you ever thought, if I can just sit down and logically explain something to somebody, they would understand and they would change their mind? Does that work? <laughs> Not most of the time. How many times over the last year, year and a half, have I thought in my mind, this makes absolutely no sense? And yet somebody will come along or I'll say, well, that's because logic has basically been thrown out the window. And you want to say, if I can just sit down and logically explain to somebody, it just all seems to make sense. It was so cute the other day, one of my daughters said, Dad, I just don't understand how people choose not to believe in God. It just makes so much more sense. Life is just so much easier. 
She, she deals with kids at school that are constantly going through problems and battles and different things. And, and she just says, if they just followed God's way, life would be so much easier. Which, which really is true. But yet the enemy doesn't want us to see it that way. Because the reality is God and truly understanding him, to some it's a stumbling block, to others, like us who believe, it is great rejoicing. Verse 14 in here in Isaiah 8. And he will become a sanctuary, a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be taken or snared and taken. Basically, the teaching of God often causes one or two responses. His people will stumble over it or trip over it and fall over it because they don't like it. Others will accept and believe and embrace it. It's the exact same teaching, but it's responded to in a couple different ways. This is addressed in 1 Peter chapter 2. This is a verse that um, we have gone over before. Verse 7 says, So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The reality is some people will embrace the truth of the word of God, and some people will reject it and go the opposite way. And this needs to be a reminder to us, an encouragement to us. Because as we share the gospel, as we encourage others, we realize that many people are going to flat out reject it. But that's nothing new. I kind of view it in my sports terms. Most of you know I play hockey, I watch hockey. Um, last night I watched the, the Red Wings hockey game. And in that game, there were a total of, I think, 70 shots taken on the goal. Sadly, the, the team opposing the Red Wings got 53 of those shots. Uh, and the game ended up to be 2-1. to one. So if you think about that, over 70 shots were taken in the game. But only three were actually made into the goal. So what do you do? Do you spend the whole time focusing? What a terrible game that is. They miss so many shots. Or do they rejoice and, but we put these in. We put these goals and we won the game. The point that I'm trying to make is sometimes as believers, it gets discouraging as we try to share our faith or we see so many people who reject the faith. But don't let it discourage you because the Bible says that there's rejoicing in heaven over one center. One sinner that comes to repentance. We can rejoice in that to understand, yes, the same word of truth that challenged us and brought us to Christ turned other people away. We move on, and we need to move on quickly here, but we see what happens is these two nations join together again, uh, Syria and Israel join together, and they attack Jerusalem, just as God said that they would do. But in the middle of that, what happens is when they're about to attack, Ahaz paid money to Assyria, which is way over here from our first map, and what they did is Assyria came and attacked Damascus, so they had to come back from attacking Jerusalem and try to defend their city, but Assyria destroys Damascus, basically. They conquer Damascus. And that leads us to Roman numeral number three. 
that God doesn't want us to be enthralled with the things of the world. 1 John chapter 2 says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world system looks sometimes so appealing, but the end results are a mess. And what with the altar at Damascus? I'm not going to read through these. I just need to basically briefly tell you what happens. Ahaz goes up to um, Damascus. Damascus had just been conquered by the Assyrians. Ahaz goes up to meet with the Assyrians. And he sees this altar at Damascus, and it looks amazing. So he decides to have an altar just like it built in Jerusalem. Now, maybe you don't remember, but originally when the altar was built at Jerusalem, God had given exact directions on how it was supposed to be built. Exactly what he wanted. And one thing about the altar is God didn't want it to be really ornate because it was a place that recognized sin and suffering, pain and humility. An altar wasn't a place of celebration. It was a place of humility because something had to be sacrificed. Instead, Ahaz comes back and he builds this incredible, beautiful altar. He falls in love with this thing of the world. And what he did is he replaced God's design. This is all found in 2 Kings 16. He replaced God's design for his own. And it goes on to tell us, even here, if you see the picture, this is kind of the picture of the temple, is he replaced this altar, which was a very simple, plain altar, with a magnificent, ornate altar, which was against God's desire. Then he takes this here, which was the molten sea, was a huge tub for cleansing, which was placed on the back of like these oxen. He cut the oxen off, the legs off, and he just basically destroyed everything that God had planned. Instead of following God's plan, he reworked the temple to follow his plan. That's what we often do today in Christianity is we want to change, quote-unquote, what's called Christianity to fit into the mold of our culture rather than conforming to his plan. And as a result, Ahaz was greatly rebuked for this. In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions. First, are you living in trust or fear? Those are your options every day. Am I going to let this fear take hold of me? Now, I'll be honest with you. Some of you are more naturally fearful in certain areas than others. And all of us have different things we fear. For instance, if I were to lay in bed at night afraid or fearful about something, for me it would be finances and taking care of my family financially. For my wife, if she were to lay in bed and not sleep because of fear, it would be because of our children over choices and decisions our kids are making. To me, I might not be happy with them or choices or decisions, but I don't lay in fear of that. I can go to sleep. It doesn't bother me at all. But on the other hand, if all of a sudden we have this bill and that bill's doing that bill's, that's where I would struggle. We all have different things we fear. The reality is, no matter what it is, we can trust that God is in control. And how do we do that is we need to let our minds be transformed and renewed by his word. As we read over and over how God took care of his people, we can say, okay, God, I can trust you with this situation, whatever it may be. Secondly, are you fearing God or are you waiting on him? I'm sorry, and waiting on him. The idea of God wants us to have a fear of him and what he can do and to live for him rather than the things in the world around us. And lastly, are you doing things God's way or the world's way? Are you trying to make Christianity conform what you think it should be? 
Or are you letting God tell you through his word? Whenever you bow your heads and close your eyes, at this time if the musicians will come forward and we'll prepare for um, our closing song and offering, take a moment to let God speak to your heart and mind this morning about the truths that have been presented.